to get too far with uh, chapter six here, I want to make you aware of a couple things. First of all, as is usual for this class, I recorded the nine o'clock session. That one is up on YouTube already. So if you feel like we didn't answer all of your questions here, there's another session that maybe has different questions on it in the other session. Um, that one, we talked a lot about the differences between intermolecular forces. We also talked a little bit about ranking. Uh, we did a couple of example problems from the uh, skill builder from last week. So that would be worth checking out in the event we don't come across those same topics here. Um, but before we get to that, I'm recording this one obviously as well for the same purposes. Um, give the people in the morning section another lens, another viewpoint, just in case. But we will start off both of those with the same idea. What is on the chapter six quiz? The chapter six quiz is as follows. There are five questions and all of them are in the short answer or essay variety. Three of those questions are related to comparing intermolecular forces and applying them to physical properties of a substance. Again, physical properties, we're talking about vapor pressure, boiling point, solubility, and so on. So questions like this would be along the lines of, I have water on one side and ethanol on the other. Which one is going to have a larger uh, boiling point? And you would compare their intermolecular forces to each other and say, okay, water has the higher boiling point because it's got two hydrogen bonds per molecule and the ethanol only has one, something like that. But that's what you would do. I give you two substances. You basically have to evaluate, okay, this substance has this with it. This substance has this with it. The intermolecular forces are going to be higher here, and it means this for whatever physical property that gets outlawed. So there'll be three of those. There will be one question on water interactions in particular. And what we're really getting into that is, can you describe how water interacts with a polar molecule? Can you describe how water interacts with an ion? Can you describe how water interacts with a nonpolar molecule? Th those kinds of things. In particular, um, there is no drawing or anything like that on this particular quiz. So you don't have to do any of that photo capture, upload business. None of that's going to apply here. Um, you will have access to your periodic table and your equation sheet. Equation sheet's not gonna do you a whole lot of good since there's no calculations, but you can use it nonetheless. Periodic table might help a little bit with polarity and that kind of stuff. So let's just say, for example, that we want to look at ion water interactions. Well, in ions, 
I know I've got positive ions and negative ions. What we would be looking at in this particular case is how does water interact with this negative ion in this case? How would it arrange itself? Well, we understand that water with its bent shape has a positive end and a negative end. Since opposite charges attract, we would assume that in the case of the negative ion, it would attract the positive ends of the water molecules. So I'm not gonna ask you to draw this, but you might have to describe what that would look like, just in general terms. The negative charge on the ion attracts the positive ends of the water molecule, which are found near the hydrogens, and they attract each other because positive attracts negative. And on the positive side, I'd have the opposite. The negative end of the oxygen attracts itself to the positive ion in the, and the water molecules arrange themselves accordingly. So that would be probably as simple as an explanation as those could get. And these are just two of the possibilities. You could also get something for a nonpolar or for a polar, and you just have to adapt the argument to whatever it is that you were talking about. <clears throat> the last question should be the easiest question. I, I would hope that most of us get all, this one right almost 100%. <clears throat> There'll be one question about phase diagrams. <clears throat> and in particular, we're talking about how to interpret a phase diagram. So if I give you a picture of a phase diagram and I just put a whole bunch of letters on it and I say, what's going on on point B? You should be able to tell me, oh, point B, that's, <clears throat> that's the line between solid and liquid. We have melting going on there. What's going on in point F? Oh, point F's the triple point or point F is where it's a solid. And that's all you have to do, interpretation. Can you tell me what is going on at certain points of the phase diagram? And if you've been doing your work, you should be able to do that pretty easily. If you have questions about that, this is the forum to ask those. So this is your breakdown of the quiz. Again, five questions in total, two points per question, three comparisons with explanation, one description of what's going on with water, and one phase diagram interpretation question. And that's it. That's all for this particular one. Any questions about this? All right, <clears throat> here's the part where I turn it over to you. We've got about half an hour's time. What are some things that you want to talk about? Some things where you've got a little bit of questioning going on and you want some further explanation. What can I do to help you get ready for this short of telling you all the answers on all the questions?
Can you do some examples on the IMFs? Uh, how do you mean, Taylor? Just another example of how they'd be on the quiz. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this would be an example of a possible question that you could see in that regard. Which has the higher vapor pressure, bromine, Br2, or ethane, C2H6? Now, to answer a question like this, we have to evaluate two different things. First of all, we have to evaluate the relationship between intermolecular forces and vapor pressure. So let's go ahead and do that one first. All right. Somebody fill in the blank for me. Stronger intermolecular forces mean what to vapor pressure? They would mean lower vapor pressure. Thank you, Aaliyah. So that's the first part. Establish the relationship between the two. If you can establish the relationship between the two, that's worth in part partial credit on these kinds of essay questions. Because what I'm evaluating from you is do you understand what you're being asked? And can you apply that correctly? So it's not just a matter of I choose one or the other and I hope I'm correct. Yes, if you get it correct in that regard, I'll give you a, some partial credit on you know, guessing right. But if you can't tell me why, then you're going to miss out on some of it as well. So if you can establish this, this is worth part of the partial credit. So you can kind of think about it as being a three-pronged thing. You have to have the correct answer. You have to have the correct relationship and you have to apply the relationship to what's going on here. And those three, three, those three things make up the two points for these kinds of problems. And it's probably something along the lines of half point, half point, one point. So we've got a half point here. We've established the correct relationship. Now we got to get into the rest. What kind of intermolecular forces exist in bromine? Is bromine polar or nonpolar? It's nonpolar. Homonuclear bonds are easy. You can't have polarity if the, same elect if the same atom is sharing electrons with another atom of the same kind. They're going to share them evenly regardless. So we've got London dispersion forces in bromine. What about ethane, C2H6? Is this polar or non? Okay. 
Okay, we're talking about a hydrocarbon here. Remember, carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativities. We almost consider their bonds to be polar, or excuse me, nonpolar on their own. And they have a great deal of symmetry in them because they're all kind of just chained up together. So hydrocarbons are nonpolar. So if I have a molecule that is just carbon and hydrogen, write down nonpolar, write down London dispersion forces. Okay, so from this standpoint, I haven't been given any help. They both have the same kind of force. So I can't look at it and go, okay, well, one's polar, one's nonpolar. The polar one's gonna have the, the better forces. I can't do that here. They both have the same kind of force. So what do we do when we evaluate the same kind of force? Size. In particular, how do we estimate that? Molar mass. So we need to go to the molar masses here. Bromine, molar mass of 79.9. There are two of them. So 159.8 is my molar mass. Molar mass of ethane, I've got two carbons and six hydrogens. 30.32. So even though we have the same amount or we have the same kind of force, we definitely have a mismatch here. The bromine is going to have much stronger London dispersion forces than the ethane will, which means that it's going to have the lower vapor pressure And so now I've established all three parts. And obviously in an essay, I would wanna write this out in a little bit of a paragraph or a narrative of some kind. But I would say C2H6 is gonna have the higher vapor pressure because both molecules exhibit London dispersion forces, but bromine's molar mass is much bigger, which means it's gonna have much greater forces. And since Greater force means lower vapor pressure. The lesser force of ethane means it's gonna have a higher vapor pressure. You don't have to put it exactly the way I did, but those are the elements I would be looking for. And you can see, I hit all three marks. I told you what, I told you the relationship, and I told you what, where it mattered. And that's how I would be evaluating it, again, somewhere on the 0 0.5, 0 0.51 kind of scale. Half a point for guessing the right answer, half a point for giving me the relationship, and a point for putting it all together. And there's probably other ways that we can nuance it in there as well. So, but that's the general idea, all right? Any questions with this example? Do we want another one like this or do we have something else we want to ask? Okay. I was waiting for somebody to say something to me. Thank you for saying something. All right, let's try another one.
All right, which has the higher boiling point? CH3OCH3 or C2H5OH? So before we get into this one, let's establish the relationship. Aaliyah? By stronger, do you mean higher? Okay, yes, they are directly related to each other. Stronger the air molecular forces are, the higher the boiling point will be. So, how do we use this information? Well, there's something to be said about these kinds of things. And you saw it in your skill builder. If you didn't quite pick up on the, the nuances there, if we have any kind of electronegative atom in our organic compound, that does tend to lead us to polar molecules. Because what ends up happening is those oxygens, take this one for example, I have I have this kind of thing going on, that oxygen in the middle, because of its lone pairs, that's gonna put a bend in the molecule and create for us that slightly negative and slightly positive area. And we would see the same kind of thing in the ethanol. Where again, if we drew this out in three dimensions, which is kind of hard to do once we get a little bit more complicated we would see the same kind of bending here that would create a slightly negative and slightly positive area there. So both of these are polar, even though they're carbon and hydrogen, the presence of those oxygens there does create that asymmetry, does create that um, bending that we look for in polar molecules. So both of these have London dispersion forces. Both of these have dipole-dipole forces. So how do we tell them apart? How can we go about answering this question? Well, we could do what we did last time. Worked the first time. Let's let's look at molar mass. You know, if we have if we have a relative tie like this, we've we've discussed we've discussed that if we have a tie. London dispersion forces suddenly become more important because now that the polarities are about the same, the London dispersion forces now matter to help us figure out the difference. Well, let's see, I've got 
if I add this together, C2H6O. If I add these together, I've got C2H6O. Well, that's not going to help us any. Molar masses are the same in both cases. So this isn't a matter of London force. Something else is going on here. The correct answer, awesome. I just about, no. Our correct answer is this one. Why is it our bottom structure? And it's hydrogen bonding. What we need to look at is in our polar group here, what is the difference between the top molecule and the bottom? Top molecule has oxygen bonded to two carbons with its two lone pairs. The, high, the bottom has a carbon group over here, but it's got this hydrogen group here. Now we established polar molecule with an OH group. This means that we've got hydrogen bonding present in addition to dipole-dipole forces. And that addition means I'm gonna have stronger intermolecular forces down here, Stronger intermolecular forces lead me to a higher boiling point. And so that's why I'm going to choose C2H5OH as my correct answer here. So take this with a measure of, of uh, clarity here. If I find that my molar masses are close to the same, I can't use molar mass as an argument. Now, this doesn't apply just to structural isomers. This applies also to anything that is close. So if I have a molecule that is 90 grams per mole and another one that's 88, there's not a big enough difference there to establish that the one with 90 is gonna have greater intermolecular forces and therefore have the stronger attractions. We can't make that determination. Now, if it's an example like the first one where you know, we had a five-fold difference in, in mass or even just you know, a, a, a two-fold difference. If we have a significant difference in mass, you know, greater than five, 10 grams per mole, then we can start talking about the impact of the London forces if, big if, if the forces are the same between the two molecules. So if I've got polar versus polar, I'm gonna to wanna to look at the molar mass. If I've got polar versus non-polar, the difference in mass doesn't make a difference. The polarity is going to have a much stronger impact on the intermolecular forces than the difference in molar masses. Think about water. Water's boiling point is 100 and its mass is 18. Now, water's kind of a special exception because of the hydrogen bonding. But even so, Look at those key differences. Polarity matters more than mass. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. We can probably do one more of these examples. Or if there's another question out there that we need to have answered, we could do that as well. Uh, 
I'm sorry, Benjamin, I can't hear you. The water's what? Oh, okay. So we kind of talked about that here already. What we're looking for in that kind of a question is how does water interact with other substances? So if I have a polar substance, then I want to talk about how the negative and the positive interact with each other. And so the water will turn itself so that the positive end is, is going to the negative pole and the negative is going to the positive, like we showed here. So if this was polar, um, just using, uh, let's, let's, let's use ammonia as an example, just for simplicity. If I have ammonia, and I wanted to show how water interacts with it. Well, I can establish that the negative side of ammonia is near the nitrogen. The positive side of the ammonia is near the hydrogens. And so all that I would show is that the oxygens would orient themselves to the hydrogens. And that the nitrogen would orient itself toward the hydrogens. So again, you aren't going to be asked to draw this. You'll have to describe it. But those attractions would exist in that kind of way. And so that would be what we would be establishing in our description is that, okay, the nitrogen has this negative center. The hydrogens in the water are going to point themselves toward that negative center. The, nitro, the ammonia has this positive center on the bottom. The oxygen is going to orient itself so that the negative oxygen interacts with the positive hydrogen. And that's kind of the gist of what you would have to say. And then for nonpolar, nonpolar, you would be talking more along the lines of if I have a whole bunch of nothing. So Let's just uh, draw out some so some nonpolar circles here. Since they don't have a positive end or a negative end, the water molecules would not interact with them what we would effectively see is that because the attractions of water are so much stronger to themselves than what they would establish here, the water molecules start to squeeze out and they form layers. And you can see this, this is pretty, this is pretty self-explanatory and common. Think about what happens when you, uh, you uh, make a salad dressing. You take your oil, you take your vinegar, you can shake it as much as you want, try to get it to emulsify. But what happens is that those hydrogen bonds in the vinegar, because it's water and acetic acid, well, they band together 
and they're way more attracted to each other than they are to the oil. And so they'll start squeezing out that oil and eventually it separates out. Unless you do something like you add some kind of emulsifier like an egg or something, which because eggs have fat soluble and water soluble components, the fat soluble being the yolk, the water soluble being the albumin, the white, you mix that up in there, it acts as an effective uh, washing agent of sorts. It helps them to interact more with each other. The dressing stays together a little bit longer as a result. And you do it well enough, uh, you can actually cause it to emulsify completely. That's kind of where those cream-based uh, uh, salad dressings come from. That's why most of them have eggs in them. Uh, because of that emulsifying agency, within the egg itself. Otherwise, what you'll see is they'll start to separate and you get the water layer, the vinegar layer, usually on the bottom because of its density and the oil layer on the top. Because as we established before, solubility occurs from mutual attraction something dissolves in something else because collectively they are more attracted to each other than they are attracted to themselves. And so they start to mix together because together they have more collective attraction and more stability as a result. Same is true here. Even in ionic compounds, we know that ions are held together with these really strong electrostatic forces. Why can a water break them apart? Well, because the ion dipole forces that form are much stronger than the hydrogen bonds in the water. And collectively, when I put together all of the ion dipole forces that exist, collectively, we have greater attraction here than we did here. And the water molecules do a little bit of shielding in separating these guys from each other, which means they also separate the positive ions from each other, the negative ions from each other. What does that do effectively? Well, those are repulsive forces that would be counteractive to the crystal. And by separating those out, some of those repulsive forces go away, which makes the attractive forces even more attractive. So those are the kinds of things you'd see in, in interactions as far as water is concerned. It's gonna be in one of those three kinds of domains. It's either water with a nonpolar. We talk about the attractive forces of water being stronger and squeezing out the nonpolars. Water and ions, where we talk about the attraction between the ions and the dipoles. Or polar, polar, and we just talk about positive pole attracting negative pole and, and vice versa. All right. We're just about out of time for today. Again, the other video is up on YouTube if you want to go check it out. We did talk about some pretty different things there, so it might be instructive for you to do so. Chapter six quiz available starting Wednesday at, well, 11.01 a.m. Not that you want to wake up to do that, but it's available all day Wednesday from midnight to midnight. Should only take you about 20 minutes to do. You get a full half hour. Have a good afternoon.